on your way in, I hope you grab some notes because you're going to need them today. <laughs> there is a lot of information. I'm a little scared that I'm going to give you too much, but we're going to work our way through it today. There will be a testimony at the end of the, um, end, near the end of the message today, and that hopefully will be helpful to you as well. If you do not know, we are in the book of Habakkuk, and if you have your Bible, go ahead and find it, all right? And I'm going to time you to see how you do here. Go ahead and find it. If there's a pew Bible, by the way, right in front of you, I do have a page number for you. 806, if that will help you. 806 in the Pew Bible, turn to Habakkuk. So this book does not have like these awesome wonders. For instance, it doesn't have like a parting of the Red Sea, right? It doesn't have a giant fell by a, a young man with a stone. It doesn't have a big fish that swallows the prophet, or it doesn't have Daniel in the lion's den. What it does have is a man of God crying out to God because of the violence and the calamity, because the law is not functioning as God desired, because God's people are not responding to, a, to God in a way that is helpful. And he is crying out, how long, O oh Lord, must these things continue on? Now, Habakkuk's prayer is our prayer at times, okay? These things are in the scriptures. This is why we read, we're going to be reading lament psalms, okay? Psalm 73 is one of those. As the psalmist was looking to God and looking around, it's like, hey, I'm struggling until he understood the totality of what God was doing. Habakkuk helps us with that as well. And so it is good for us to understand these things. It is good for us to cry out to God. It is good for us to hear from God as we are trying to make sense of our sometimes up and down, topsy turvy life. Life is difficult, right? Now, not saying that it is not good, and there are tremendous blessings, and there's tremendous strength, and there's tremendous joy, and there's tremendous promises that we hold on to and receive both now and in eternity. But at times we cry out, how long, O oh Lord? And so this is why God is leading us in this book, okay? So let's turn to it right now. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to help us a little bit. We're going to read what we did last week. It's only four or five verses. And then I'm going to read our primary text from this week. And then I have a chart there, and this is going to hopefully be helpful for you, where I'm overlaying the cry of Habakkuk with the response of God. So we're going to see what Habakkuk said and then how God responded and then what the implication, what the meaning, what the purpose of that is. And we're going to look at these side by side and I'm going to bring forward three things that I hope that you hear today. And most importantly, I hope that you hear from God today, right? Who cares what I say, right? My words are going to vanish like dust, right? God's word remains forever, okay? And so the hope is that God would speak to you from his word, and you would grab onto something, that you would hold onto something, that your understanding would increase, and your trust in God would continue to grow. This is what this book is all about, to help us when things are tough and difficult. There's pain, there's confusion, and we're in faith crying out to God. And at times we need to understand these things dearly and personable. Okay, so this is Habakkuk chapter 1. I'm going to read 1 through 4, and then we're going to go and look at 5 through 11. So this was last week's, and this is how it opens. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. He says, how long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you, violence, but you don't save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? There's destruction and violence. They're before me. There's strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, God, 
Your law, it's paralyzed. And justice mm, never prevails. The wicked surround me. They hem in the righteous. There's more of them than there are those who are serving you. So that your justice, God, it's perverted. Okay? This is a strong prayer. This is the guy feeling the pain, feeling pressure. Right? He's not turning from God in difficulty, but turning towards God. That's important. Okay? Often people say, well, it's difficult right now. I'm not understanding this pain or this sorrow, this suffering or this event that took place. My challenge to you is to be like Habakkuk and so many that we read about in the Bible and that will turn towards God in the midst of these difficult difficulties versus turning some other place. So Habakkuk is doing this, okay? And he's saying, God, I need you to respond. You haven't. Why are you not doing anything? Now, our verses for this week, we hear within God responding to this prayer of Habakkuk. And perhaps he's been praying this for a while. It sounds like it. So sometimes when you pray, you think, God must answer me right this moment, okay? God knows a little bit more than you. And he knows when to answer you. And we'll see some of these things later on. So this is God's response to his servant Habakkuk. This is Habakkuk chapter 1 now, starting with verse 5. This is what God said. Habakkuk, hey, hey, look at the nations and watch. And be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe. Even... If you were told, I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are feared and they are dreaded people. They are logged in themselves and they promote their own honor. Now, their horses are swifter than lepers, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an evil, swooping to devour. They all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. By building earthen ramps, they capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on, guilty people whose own strength is their God. Let's stop there. What kind of response is that? Right? Could you imagine him being there? It's like, hey, can you like convince people or convict them? Can you have them turn from their sin? You know, God, can you help me a little bit? God says, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do something, bro. You're not going to believe this. But this is my answer. How, what would you do if you were Habakkuk hearing this? Like, and we're going to see his response next week. By the way, you can read ahead. You can read ahead. It's okay, right? Okay. We'll hear what he says, and there's this dialogue about this. But we have to, we have to deal with this response from God. Right? What is this response? How does it relate to what Habakkuk is crying out? And what can we learn from God's response to this prayer of how long? Okay? So this is where the overlay comes in. This is where my little chart comes in. Okay? So if you have your notes, and they're online, by the way, if you're joining us online, go over somewhere in the World Wide Web. I think they're on the website, or maybe they're in the box. Okay? You can see these things. Okay? I hope you take these home. I hope you think about these things longer than the, you know, half an hour or 45 minutes or an hour and a half that I speak. Just kidding. It's not going to be that long, okay? But pay attention, right? It's a lot of stuff, all right? So here we go. First, I'm just going to break it down verse by verse, okay? We're going to go to the right. We're going to work through this so we can see uh, Habakkuk's, excuse me, yeah, Habakkuk, I said it right, Habakkuk's lament, God's response, and then the implication. So here's the first one. So this is what he says in verse 2. How long, O Lord, do you not listen? You do not save, okay? So the complaint is, God, you don't listen to me. You're not responding. Now, this is God's response. This is in verse 5. Habakkuk, I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. 
I'm raising up the Babylonians. Habakkuk, I hear you, okay? So this is the impl implications. Habakkuk, you say that I don't listen. I do listen. And now it's your turn to listen, right? I have been acting, and it will happen in your day. Habakkuk, I heard you when you prayed, and, and there's things that going on that I'm responding to. So you say, I don't listen. I did listen, and I'm doing some things that are going to happen in your day. Okay, that's the first response. We're going to break it down a little bit later, but it's important for us to see this overlay. Okay, second complaint by Habakkuk is this. You make me look at injustice. God, why are you making me look at these things that are so horrific? God's response to this complaint is this in verse 5. Habakkuk, look to the nations. You're so myopic in your understanding, so narrow in your view. Open up your eyes. Look beyond what you currently are fixating on and be utterly amazed. So the implication for us is that you need to look and see the bigger picture. We're going to come back to that, but that is God's response to him and to us in our crying out. Now, the next thing that Habakkuk laments is this, saying to God, you, God, tolerate wrongdoing and destruction and violence and strife and escalating conflict. Now, check this out. Then he describes the Babylonians and saying, okay, they, the Babylonians, they're ruthless, they're impetuous, they're feared, they're dreaded, they're swift, they're fierce, they're intent on violence. They sweep across the whole earth, they seize dwellings, not their own, and they gather prisoners like sand, right? So this is the implication. <laughs> it says, I do not tolerate wrongdoing, and I will deal with it. Judgment is coming, Habakkuk. I am working. Now, we're going to talk about why this and why to that, okay? But this is how God's responding to these complaints. Next, your law is paralyzed, God. And God says, I'm bringing in some people that they're a law to themselves. This is God's response. They promote their own honor, with the implication being this. I will discipline those who paralyze my law with people who are their own law. If you don't like my law, then they will be your law. Okay? We're going to see this again as we break this down. So they have said, God, I don't want your laws. So it's okay, if you don't want my laws, then here, I'll, I'll bring you something else. You want, you, want, you want your own laws? I'm going to bring some people that have their own laws. Okay. Next is this. Habakkuk says... Your justice, in verse 4, never prevails. And then God's response is, well, they, the Babylonians, they mock kings and scoff at rulers, right? So you're saying that those who are in charge, the kings and the rulers, they don't pay attention to your justice. Well, I'm going to bring in some people that don't pay attention to them at either, right? And they are coming in as their own authority. So this is the implication. If you don't like my authority, God is saying, then I'll give you those who completely disregard authority. Whoa. Now the next one is this. Habakkuk complains, the wicked hem in the righteous. There are more wicked that surround those who are trying to serve and honor you, the quote-unquote God-fearing people. God responded, well, they, in verse 10, they laugh at all fortified cities. They build earthen ramps. They capture them. So this is what he's saying. In, in that type of warfare, there was a city. There was a wall around it, okay? And that the wall hems in the people. He's saying, okay, just like you feel like that you are hemmed in by wickedness, I'm going to hem in, okay, I'm going to siege those who are thinking that they're more powerful by using something that's more powerful. I'm going to hem in the wicked. The wicked surround the righteous. Now, those who are wicked will be surrounded by a greater force. That is mind-blowing, <laughs> I'm going to bring more people in to surround those who are persecuting you. Okay. Lastly, Habakkuk complains, laments, 
God, your justice is perverted. And then he said, okay, I'm bringing in these people that they're guilty, right? And their own strength is their own God. They do not worship me. They worship might is right. And by the way, often in our society, this is the ethic that is established. If you have power, if you have enough money, if you know enough lawyers, if you have enough connections, right, might is right. A God unto themselves. There's no fear of God. There's no understanding what's right and wrong in a moral sense, in a biblical sense. If I can do it, I will do it. This is often how our world, outside of biblical Christianity, functions ethically. So the implication to Habakkuk is this. If you don't want, and these people, right, if they don't want my justice, then I will give you their justice. If you don't want my justice, then I'm going to give you someone else's justice. Where the guilty rule by brute strength, okay? So there's the overlay. Now, we're going to get to these points. So what are, what are we to, to do? What are we to grasp from this? Okay, here's number one, okay? This will hopefully help you understand that God hears. That's good news, by the way, okay? Through his word, God has given us language for all types of prayers and all kinds of occasions including lament or complaint or protest prayer. By the way, this is one of the primary reasons we have this song book of Psalms. Do you guys like the book of Psalms? Please say yes. Please say yes, okay? <laughs> it's amazing. It's probably one of the most beloved books in all of the Bible. Why? There's 150 songs in there. This, by the way, is the hymnal for the Jewish people and God's people. Just put it that way, right? They sing these prayers. And in there, there's great um, um, banners and great exclamation of God's strength and His goodness. And in there, there's truths like the Lord is my shepherd, right? There's other truths that we grab onto, but there's a whole gamut of the emotions of human hearts that is displayed there in the Psalms. From glorious exaltation to depths of depression and despair. All of these things are there and they're given to us. As prayers are given to us, as these things are good for us to know, these things are part of our experience as humans, and these things are, are good for us to pray. People love the Psalms because often it gets expression of our heart and we see God's goodness and faithfulness and we gain perspective like Psalm 73, which can be incredibly helpful to us. So when you call out to God, by the way, God sees, he hears, he knows. God does not have a hearing problem, right? He's never called Costco asking for his hearing aids to get in quick, right? <laughs> he hears just fine, right? He doesn't need glasses, right? He knows you. You haven't been lost in the shuffle of billions of people. Oh, yeah, where's that guy Dave again? I can't seem to find him, right? <laughs> know this. Sometimes you feel that way, right? Hey, God. Hey, hey, hey. It's getting pretty hard out here. <laughs> hey, God, I'm over here. Hey, let me wave my hands. Hey. Here's a flare. <laughs> God, I'm over here. <laughs> you feel that way? Sometimes, here's the truth, God hasn't lost track of you, right? right? <laughs> he knows where you are, right? That truth helps us stand in confidence to the throne of grace, right? God hears us. We pray to God because of our relationship with Him. Communication in any relationship is critical. 
our communication reflects and contains relationships. Good news is that God gives us access to himself, which is the greatest of all gifts. Do you just hear me there, right? The greatest of all gifts that God gives us is not salvation. Right? Even though salvation is glorious, it's not even a new life, which is glorious. It's not even a new heaven and a new earth. It's not even stuff for we to survive. The greatest gift God gives us is access to himself. Do you understand that God, the creator of the universe, invites you into his very throne room? He is more magnificent, more important than any person on this planet. It is hard to get some appointments with people, right? You just can't call the White House and say, yeah, can I go see Joe for a bit, right? Not going to happen. And here you have someone that is far greater than any celebrity, any politician, anybody with extreme wealth. God himself gives us invitation to be with him. Why would we not want to talk to him, right? This is Ephesians chapter 2 says this, though... For through him we both have, that's Christ, and through Christ we both have access in one spirit to the Father. This, you should circle this. We have access. Why? Because of Jesus. How? By the Spirit. To whom? The Father. Verse 19. So when you are, so then, you and I are no longer strangers and aliens, but we are, these are people outside, right? We're not talking UFO aliens here, Okay. No laughter. Good job, Dave. Nice job. Okay. <laughs> Strangers and aliens, right? You're no longer someone who's on the outside, but you and I are fellow citizens with the saints. And check this out. Members of the household of God. If there's any membership that you should hang on to, it's this one, right? More than Sam's Club, more than Costco. This is the most important membership that you will ever have. God, because of Christ, and when we believe in Jesus by his spirit, we have access to the Father because we're part of the community and we're part of the family, right? That's incredible. I have two daughters, and when they call... If I can, which is about 95% of the time, I say, hold on, and I pick up the phone. Why? Because they're part of the family, right? They're part of my kids. And I say, you know what? I'm going to get this call, right? Same with my wife. She says, amen, amen, all right, man. <laughs> There's special access. Why? Because we're family. You are part of the family of God. Do you understand that? When you talk to your dad, he's going to listen. He'll hear you. He'll draw close to you. You draw close to God, he'll draw close to you. It's a promise. So you have to fight your own mind sometimes if you think, well, God has forgotten me. He hasn't. Well, Dave, why can you say that? I read the Bible. And it says that we have access to the Father through Christ by the Spirit. Here's another one, 1 Peter 3.10. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. So this is people who have been made righteous because of the blood of Christ. Okay, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. This is good news for us. This is good good news for Habakkuk. This is good news for those who suffer, and at times we indeed do suffer. So when we pray, and in particular on difficult times, we pray and we build and express our relationship with God. God has ordained both the means and the ends to our prayers. Praying is important in God's sovereignty. He works this way because he loves us, and we literally get to partner with God and what he's doing in the world. That should be mind-blowing to you, right? He's sovereign, he's in control, but he also ordains that we pray. 
so that we will grow and that he will be glorified. Part, the main part of why we pray is to glorify God. So when we ask God for something and we see that something, we can know in our brain that it wasn't our might or our power or our goodness that made it happen, but it was God. Do you understand that, right? So sometimes he withholds stuff because we're not praying, right? And we say, well, it's because of my might or my strength or my power that I've gotten all of this stuff, right? It's all about you. Christianity isn't all about you. It's all about Jesus, right? It's all about the Father. It's all about the glory of God. So we pray. So this is the response to this. Trust in God. Trust his timing. Trust that he hears you. Wait for him in faith. Now tuck that in. Draw that close, especially if you are struggling with something. And my guess is you're probably struggling with something, right? Hang on to this. God hears you. Trust his timing. Now, this leads to the second point. Understand that there's a bigger picture, right? We see Habakkuk saying, hey, 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 all I'm seeing is this right here. God says, hey, 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 Habakkuk, McFly, Look up a little bit. Thank you. You got that joke. One person. Okay. It's a tough today. Two of you. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Look around a little bit. You and I are finite. You know that? Which means you don't know everything, right? God, by the way, is infinite. He knows everything, right? God knows all things. He is transcended, is the theological term, above and beyond, way beyond us. God sees the bigger picture. Not only is he working with your life, but he's working with your family's life. Not only is he working with your family's life, he's, he's working with your school or your workplace. Not only is God working in there, he's the extended family, he's also working in our community. Not only is God working in our community, he's working in our state. Not only is God working in our state, he's working in our country. Not only is God working in our country, he's working in the entire world. And not only is he looking at the entire word, but, world, but he's looking at it not just at this time, but for all time. If you knew what God knew, right? You would trust his plan. <laughs> How foolish are we when we think that God needs to respond to us based upon our perspective? Well, God, of course you need to do what I'm telling you to do because I know the best thing to do, God. And if you don't do it right now, I'm going to be mad at you. Now, you would never say that. Or maybe you would say that. Because <laughs> some of us say that in our heart, right? Lift up your eyes. Trust that God knows what he's doing. His plan is for you, but it's not about you. <laughs> it's for you, but it's bigger than you. He's working all of these things. He sees a little bit more than you do. He knows a lot more than you do. Sees a lot more than you do. Understands a lot more than you do. Will you trust him? In and under all circumstances. Will you worship him and give way to him and concede and trust him in all sufficiency. His all sufficiency and his sovereignty. This helps us. Habakkuk, look around. Look broader. See the big picture. I am working, but you need to understand this. By the way, Isaiah, I have this here. Isaiah says these things. Isaiah 55 says, For my thoughts, by the way, are not your thoughts, and neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Trust his wisdom, right? Trust his plan. Trust his, check this out, heart. 
He does want the best for us. And often our definition of best and his definition of best aren't always the same, right? Our definition is the best is, hey, 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 mo money, right? We think the best is, hey, 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 easier times. We think, hey, the best is, hey, 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 I get the promotion, I get the raise, everyone loves me and my hair grows back, right? (laughs) There, someone, a laugh. <laughs> we think this, but I trust God right? that His plan is better than my plan, bigger than my plan, <laughs> greater than my plan. You know what helps me? And I hope this will help you. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Now, we like this, but I want you to understand what is being said here to us. And we know that in all things, That's hard times. In all things, God, what does he do? Works for what? The good. What? Of those who love him. Who have been called according to his purpose. Now, we got to connect this to the next verse, 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined for what? To be conformed to the image of a Son, that he, Christ, might be firstborn among many brothers and sisters. God's ultimate goal is to shape you into the image of Jesus. Do you understand that, right? That's what he's doing, right? His goal isn't your comfort. His goal is your Christ-likeness, right? And in order to look like Christ, there are times when we must persevere. There's times when we must overcome. There are times in which we must wait. There's times in which we must cry out. There's times in which we need to be patient and loving and honoring and holy in the midst of difficulty and sorrows and trials and temptations and all of these things. Even Christ was tempted. Can you get your mind around that? Not, he didn't sin. Right? He didn't sin. Perfection was perfected by what he endured. Put your mind around that. Right? And so in our trials and difficulties, and some are horrendous, some are overwhelming, some take a long time to see the bigger picture. Please trust God and understand what he's doing. He's shaping you into the image of his son so that when we get up upstairs to heaven in the great family reunion, there's family resemblance. We look like Jesus. Oh, I know him. He looks like his older brother. Look at that spitting image. You see what I'm saying here, right? It's family. So he says, okay, You might need to go through some stuff. Are you going to press into me? Are you going to be conformed to me? I'm no tool and die maker, but I know when they make stuff, they hit it, right? They have an image in which they're trying to produce in that thing. The image that God is trying to produce in you is Christ, right? So sometimes, man, we got to get some stuff trimmed off. Sometimes we got to feel some of the pressure. Sometimes we have to remain and say, God, do your work in me. I don't understand all this. I don't like it all. It's very uncomfortable and overwhelmingly painful, but God, I trust you. Glorify yourself in this. That's a good prayer. Pray these things. What is he doing? Conforming us into the image of the Son. Well, why did he say that? Well, he can use all things to help you with that. And this is the truth we don't like, but this is the truth we need. Right? This is helpful. Okay? Know that God hears you. Understand there's a bigger picture. Will you trust Him? Trust in God. Trust His heart. Trust His knowledge. Trust His process. Wait for Him in faith. That, by the way, is the theme for the book of Habakkuk. The righteous will live by faith. 
in the midst of difficulty. This is helping us. Last thing that I'm going to look at in this passage. I want you to understand that God will deal with sin. And we're going to read some more. And we're going to see uh, Habakkuk's complaint next week. And we're going to see the righteous shall live by faith. And we'll see how God actually deals with the Babylonians as well. And we'll see how Habakkuk then prays God and, and says a beautiful psalm of praise at the end. We'll see these things. But at this point, God is communicating. God will deal with sin. And there's a number of ways in which he does so. Number one. God deals with sin by inviting us to repent, right? You should say amen right there. Come on. He doesn't say you sinned, you're done, right? It's a good thing that God is long-suffering with sinners because you and I would be fried out of the gate, right? Maybe you wouldn't, but I would. <laughs> broke it, broke it, broke it, or broke it, or broke it. Ten Commandments. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. Jesus' message, by the way, right out of the gate, was what? <laughs> Repent. For the what? Kingdom of heaven. It's at hand. Acts says this again. It's all over scripture. I put a bunch of references in here. Put a lot of references in there. Please go home, read them. Make sure that I'm not lying to you. Okay. Acts 3. Repent, therefore, and turn back. Why? That your sins may be blotted out. Why? That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. <laughs> Repentance is a gateway to blessing. Do you understand this? The hooks of sin drag us to places you do not want to go and cost you a lot more than you want to pay. This is how it works. And so repentance is saying, I'm letting this go, God. Get this out of me so that you can have freedom from these things. The good news is, is that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and to just forgive our sins. God doesn't say, hmm, I don't think so. That's a little too bad. Someone truly repents Repentance is more than just being sorry that you got caught. It's believing that what you did was wrong. You own it. I lied. I stole something. I was angry. Or whatever that is, you own it. I did this. This damage was done. This was wrong. Please forgive me. I repent. And then you turn and ask God for the strength to go the other direction. That's repentance. Repentance. <laughs> repentance. And God says, hey, if you repent, I'll forgive you. And I'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. This is the invitation to us. It's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin. And we better be grateful for that. Right? If you're not being convicted of sin, you have a more difficult problem. Number two, God at times deals with sin by using a greater evil to mitigate and correct a lesser evil. Now, this is a little mind-blowing, right? This is what we're seeing in the book of Habakkuk, right? God says, hey, the leaders aren't listening to me. They're saying that they're going to take uh, matters on their own power, that they're going to pervert justice, might is right. So God says, okay, if that's what you want, come here, Babylonians. Right? You don't want to listen to me. I'm going to give you something a little bit harder for you, more difficult for you, so that you will repent. That's the goal, by the way. When God disciplines those he loves, it's not punitive just to smash you. It's redemptive to help you. Hear that. That's discipline. If you have kids, you understand that. You discipline them because you love them, giving them external motivation so they'll have internal motivation to do what's right. Okay? The most loving thing a parent can do, by the way, is not let you do whatever you want as a child. Because they love parents, if you're a good parent, you will 
correct your child to help them to bless them. God does the same thing for us, right? Now, in the New Testament, here's some verses that might shock you if you don't read your Bible, right? This is, this is like 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, okay? The context is that there is a, a guy in the church who is sleeping with his stepmom, okay? And the church was like, cool with it. Paul's like, what are you doing? That's not okay. They were like celebrating it. He says, hey, 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 when you get together, number one, kick the dude out, right? By the way, I have kicked people out of church before. Unrepentive threats. Right? Just like in your body, if you have a cancer in your body, you don't say, all right, live long and prosper, cancer, do your thing. Yay, cancer. No one ever says that. What do they say? We got to get rid of this because if we don't, it's going to spread into the other places and cause greater, greater, and more and more problems. So we deal with it now. Right? So this is what Paul says. <laughs> he says, hey, guys, this is what you want you to do. Get this person, and then check this out. This is an instruction to the church of Corinth to deliver this man to Satan. What? For the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Okay? What? Pastor, I thought you were supposed to save us from Satan. <laughs> He's saying, listen, this guy isn't repenting. And so, you know what? Turn him over to a greater evil. If he wants to do this type of behavior, okay, go ahead. If you don't want God as your, as your authority, then try Satan on for size, okay? See how that works for you. So that the person would hopefully become so miserable that they repent and come back to Christ, by the way, this advice is given a second time to this young pastor named Timothy. He says, hey, 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 hand over these two people, Hymenaeus and Alexander. This is 1 Timothy chapter 1. Do I have it here? I do. Yeah. Okay. Hand them to Satan so they may not learn to blaspheme. Okay. Again, this is mind-blowing, right? So this is God's word, by the way saying, hey, these two guys who once followed now are blaspheming Christ. And he says, okay, you've talked to them, you've instructed them, you look to help them, and they refuse. So you know what? If they want to mm, come against Christ, all right, if they don't want to serve God, then turn them over to Satan. What? Why? So that they may learn not to blaspheme from Satan? Mm. People think that not serving God is better. It's not better. And times, it is appropriate to say, that's what you want? Okay. Often in Christianity, being connected to the community of Christ is our protection. Do you hear me? Get them out. And if they don't want this and they're on their own, if they're on their own, guess what? Satan, the lion who is looking who he can devour, will seize him and say, mm, lunchtime. Mm. Now, the point is that they won't be destroyed. That's not the point. Get them out of here because we hate them. That's not the issue at all. God, will you deal with them because we love them, because their soul is more important than their, their sin? And so God will turn them over so that they will come and learn what is best and what is better and what is right and return to God. Do you understand this? It's hard. You guys are like, I don't know if I like that, Pastor. I didn't write this. Amen. But it's effective. This is what's happening, by the way, in Habakkuk. Right? Now, will God deal with Satan? Absolutely, he will. There's reasons. There's, there's lots of theological stuff. I can't go there. We'll just leave it. Number three, I've got to keep going. Number three, how does God deal with sin? God deals with sin by giving us over to our sin. <laughs> how do you like that? Have you ever read the book of Romans? Romans chapter one, you say, I haven't read Romans. Read it. Read one through, uh, excuse me, chapter one, verses 18 down to like 32. Well, what's the deal? 
God, people refuse to obey God, so it says, you don't want to glorify me, you don't want to acknowledge me from all of the things that I've created, my invisible qualities are there because of all of this stuff. If you don't acknowledge me, you say, no, you know what, I want to live life on my own terms and do things how I want to do it, and no thank you, God. He says, okay, if you want that, go ahead. Turns them over. And you'll see the level of sin get worse. And then people say, God gives them time to repent, and they say, no, I don't want to. And you know what? Sin, by the way, is progressive. <laughs> he says, all right, go ahead then. It gets worse, right? And then the people say, hey, man, you know what? I want to do exactly what I want. And then you'll read it again. God turns them over, and it gets worse. <laughs> Sometimes God's dealing with sin is giving us over to sin in the hopes that we would recognize how bad it actually is and that we would turn to the light. Have you ever heard of the prodigal song? You remember how that works? Right, prodigal son? He says, mm, I don't want you so much. You know what the father did? Okay, I'll give you what you want. Right? That's wisdom. So he gets what he wants. He goes and does what he wants. And he comes to the end and like, mm, I don't think I want this. And he returns back. Notice the father didn't go with him. He waited for him. An expectation. He wasn't like, yeah, I deserve you right, pig food eater. He didn't say that. He was longing for his son, waiting for his son, looking for his son. And when he showed up, he took off and ran. His heart was broken. So God's not up there gleefully thinking, ah, ha, 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 I've got you now. His heart is broken. That's what you want? You want that more than you want me? Okay. Don't think that God giving you over to greater and greater sin is God approving of the sin. He's trying to help us to see, okay, you want that? Come back. This is the last thing, all right? Number four, God deals with sin in the final judgment. <laughs> it's all over the Bible. I gave you tons of verses there. This is the reality. This is the reality. This is the reality. This is the reality. Right? 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we, we. Who's we? Everyone. We must, right? there's no wiggle room here, there's not like an exit door, we all must appear before the judgment seat of who? Christ. <laughs> every person, you, me, everybody. Well, I don't believe in that. It doesn't matter what you believe, this is the truth. Well, you know, Buddhists can go over here and Muslims will go over there, and if you're an atheist, okay, get in that line. Everyone must appear. Is this true or is this not true? Where? Before the judgment seat of Christ, why? So that each one may receive what is due for what he or she has done in the body. Whether good or evil, God makes all things right in the end. This should give you confidence and this should scare you. Right? Just being honest. It's called the fear of God. This helps us. This is where our faith helps us because of God's goodness. God, help us to be in grace. This is the reality of everyone alive. The final review. This is where success is determined or failure is determined. It's not in how much money you make, but who you know. Do you know Christ and what did you do with what I gave you? I bought a really big boat nice. I'm not saying that boats aren't okay. I like boats. But is that the best way? Is that the best thing? Why? Well, the people see how cool I am. Who cares? We have to think about this. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10. This is the last verses, I think. Maybe not. Last one. Then we're going to have Bob. Bob, get ready. Why don't you come on up? I know I was going to go long today, so I'm trying to hurry. Okay. Hmm. You say people are getting away with stuff. Yeah, they'll get away with it, but they're not going to get away with it forever. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses, this is Hebrews 10, dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. So this is what Paul is saying. Now check this out. How much worse punishment what, do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? You say, you know what? I don't want Jesus. I don't need Jesus. Kind of stay out of my business, right? 
What's going to happen to these people? They profaned the blood of the covenant which he, which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. Outraged the spirit of grace. <laughs> this is strong language. For we know him who said, mm, Vengeance is mine. I will repay. The Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Thank you, Jonathan Edwards. We have to realize this. I would not be a good pastor to you if I did not tell you this reality. Jesus saves us from the wrath of God justly due to us because of our sin. We must be in Christ. You hear him. You must. He's the only shelter. He's the only safe place. We are made righteous in him. To help us to know this, to trust in God and trust his judgment and wait for him in faith. Get your mind around these things. Okay. Bob, glad you're here. I've asked him to share a testimony of some, of some of the stuff, so go for it. Good morning, everybody. Um, when Dave asked me to share some of my story, my prayer since then has been that um, some of the, what I'm going to share with you, which demonstrates the truth from God's word in Habakkuk, what Pastor Dave has been uh, sharing with us this morning, uh, has played out in my life, and it would also be helpful in your own journey. So that's my, my prayer for you as I put my thoughts together. Um, I, have, I became a believer when I was in college, over half a century ago, a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, as I look back after 54 years, I have to admit that um, for a considerable period of, of my Christian life, I was a pretty immature believer. And uh, as so many of us, particularly, I, I can speak for me, my, I was a believer. I trusted in, in Jesus, but I also had a certain delimited sense that uh, he was part of my life. And uh, I had my own plans. And uh, as I got out of college, I had a really interesting career. I married. Uh, my wife and I had three children, and, uh, and life was good. Uh, I resisted being involved in leadership at the church, even though I was asked. I, there were certain things that I would do for Jesus. I was involved in ministry, but yet I was what I would call an immature Christian. And as I look back on it, I, um, I would say that my faith had not been tested. It had not been refined, as it speaks in the Old Testament about the refiner's fire of our belief and our, and our faith in God. And so uh, as my life proceeded uh, into the 30s and 40s, there were a series of crises, uh, disasters that, that happened in my life. And I'll just share a couple with you that have to do with uh, my, my own immediate family. Uh, as I say, um, my wife and I had three children, uh, our second child, uh, died as a newborn after 11 days, very difficult uh, situation. And I, I don't think we really dealt with it very well, my, my wife and I. And I think it affected our, our relationship to a degree. Um, and then uh, at age 46, my wife passed away very, very suddenly. Some of you remember that. And um, that also was a very difficult uh, experience for myself and my two teenage children. And then I have to offer that uh, probably the most poignant thing, um, experience that, that I then had subsequent to that about 20 years ago now is my 26-year-old son who a uh, very promising um, career left that to become a missionary with Campus Crusade down in Mexico. And uh, he was sent home at age 24 because he was dealing with very severe depression and bipolar disorder, which the, um, the medical system struggled with to help him. And then after a year and a half, he committed suicide at age 26. And um, 
I share these things because as, as difficult as they are to, to um, talk about, after the extended period of, of uh, reflecting on this, um, I have to say that uh, they were defining moments in my personal life and my spiritual life. And they represented opportunities to experience God, what he would do in my, my life subsequent to that. Um, never could bring back any of my family. And, you know, there are scars that he helped heal. But beyond that, uh, he accomplished amazing things that I don't think I would be where I am spiritually today without those very difficult uh, experiences that I had. And I, and I have to offer, we, I, I don't say these things, I mentioned this to Dave yesterday, I don't save these things uh, to suggest that I'm bragging or, you know, look how good I am. I, I can assure you I am not a spiritual superhero. Um, I have a very powerful God in my life, and he has helped me uh, be an overcomer of a lot of those difficulties. And, and so um, everyone has difficult situations. You know, if, if everyone had an opportunity to stand up here, you would all share difficult, probably more difficult than mine. And my loss, my story is no, no more important and, and uh, more difficult than, than your loss. It just has been my own story. A couple of years ago, I read a book called um, The Story, and basically the, the theme of that, uh, it draws from scriptural truth and that, that there is a macro story that uh, the Lord will achieve his purpose. And Dave, in Romans 8:28 and 29, I appreciate him doing that because I was gonna quote it and now I can skip that because you... <laughs> Um, it was on, on the board, but our purpose, uh, his purpose, is that we would be conformed in the image of Christ. And that uh, prior to that, there's this verse, all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. I didn't understand that at the time, but as I look back on that, uh, I can attest to that, that that is the truth of God's word, and it's the truth in, in my own story. So I, I just wanted to offer that as I've uh, progressed in my life, the issue of God's timing, um, I think God was way upstream on all of these experiences that I've had, working, preparing people, preparing my heart. When I was a brand new believer, I had a friend who kind of forced me on a on a, a weekly basis to memorize scripture as he discipled me. And those scriptures still resonate with me 54 years later as I, as I journey along. So God's timing is perfect. Um, secondly, the issue of trust. Um, I've learned how to trust God, even though in the immediate situation I may not understand it. And the issue is obedience, to trust him that he uh, the outcome, as the verse says, all things work together for good. Trust him for the outcome as, uh, as you progress step by step. And step by step. And um, I just want to say there are a couple how-tos. Uh, one of them is that as God works upstream, he puts people in your life. And uh, like I say, my first wife died very young. Um, very shortly after that, God brought another woman into my life. Uh, and a strong Christian woman who has helped me, you know, through a lot of these. In fact, um, we got married six months prior to, to the death of my son. Couldn't have gotten through it uh, without, without her um, partnering with me. Um, also other Christians, and I have to say, as Dave said, you know, the church, um, I am so glad that even when the church that was in this building was having troubles, God encouraged me to stay here. There's, there's more to come and just uh, hang in there. And then um, here we are at, at Cross Point. So um, my being here, your being here is just not coincidence or just a matter of, of choice. Um, the other is that the power of the word of God. Um, I always read the word, but it, a lot of times it was more of a head thing than ac actually experience and application. Um, as, I, as I look back, uh, the power of the word of God, the truth of the word, memorizing scripture, 
54 years ago. It's amazing, I can still remember it. I don't remember what I had for lunch yesterday, but I can remember scripture <laughs> that you know God has, has laid on my heart. Um, and then lastly, um, the, the issue of the relationship with Jesus is the most important, important thing. It's, it's, he's no longer present in my life. I would have to say my goal is that he would be paramount in my life and that, um, and that he would govern my life step by steps and prayer with, to, to God, the relationship with him is so important. Um, you know, I, I have a, I don't know if I can do this and lay it down, but you know, one of the thoughts is that uh, God will, that we are, we are supposed to hang on to God, and so, you know, you have the image that you're hanging on to God. It's kind of dependent on your strength, but um, I have the image, and I'll put this down just to show you. My image is the Matt Redmond song, God, uh, Jesus will never let you go, and so it's more like, I would say, like the fireman's grip. I don't know if any of you are firefighters, but uh, it's like this. He still got you. Okay, um, two books that have been very helpful to me. Obviously, I referenced it. Um, I have a couple of verses at the very end, and then Dave, I'm done. But uh, another one I would like to offer, if, if any of you are struggling with loss, with grief, with um, whatever that would be, it doesn't have to be deaths in the family like mine, but I know uh, we even have that right now within this church. Uh, this is a wonderful book. Um, it was put in my hands. Other than scripture, the book called A Grace Disguised by Jerry Sitzer. It's in the library. Um, this book, short chapters, difficult issues that every one of us deals with when you're dealing with loss, I would encourage you to read it. I didn't pick it up until six months after uh, I should have but my wife did, and then she finally put it in front of me and said, Bob, read it, and I did. We have given many books, many of these away, still in print, but it's in our library. I would encourage you to pick this up, read through it at your own pace. God's truth speaks through this. Uh, he's a Christian man, has his own story. Um, scripture um, is the, the basis of it. Okay, two final Verses, if I may. With what Habakkuk was going through and what we go through, I just wanted to quote this, one of the verses that I learned a long time ago. Consider it pure joy, my brother. Uh, I'm sorry, James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in, not lacking in anything. Am I perfect? Am I complete? No, just ask Nancy. But I'm, I'm, on, I'm on track as I trust God. Um, I pray that um, step by step, uh, I will be obedient to him. And then finally, uh, this is my life verse, and it's uh, my last thought here. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. And that's my prayer for myself, my prayer for you. And uh, I appreciate your listening to me. Thank you. Well done, Bob. That was, uh, that was wonderful. That's beautiful. That's powerful. That's reality. Okay. He's been through some stuff, y'all. And uh, he still serves the church and still serves the Lord as a humble minister. And so I am grateful for testimonies like that of people, instead of getting hardened by heartache, turn to God in humility and look to him. And so um, I know we're a little over time, so this is how we're going to end the service, okay? 
Um, Rob's going to play a song, Lord, I Need You, is the song. And so <clears throat> there's a couple, this is what we're going to do, and I'm not going to do a benediction. I'm going to pray. We'll do the song. And so you have three options when this song is playing. Number one, you sit here and you contemplate, okay? You're free to do that. You can sing along. You can do whatever you need to do. Uh, second, you say, hey, hey, man, I need some prayer, right? I am struggling right now. Okay, this is what I want you to do, okay? I want you to come up here, okay? I'm going to ask Bob and Nancy to be up here. These guys will pray, pray for you. There's other people that will pray for you. you just, and it's just saying, God, <laughs> I'm here. And you say, I need some extra prayer today, right? During this song, I'll be here. My wife's right here, right? People have been going through stuff. Just come up here, right? You don't have to tell us all of it. It's all right. We can just pray, right? And so don't leave without being together in that, okay? So that's your second option. Third option, right? You need to go someplace, all right? Go, but just do it quietly, right? If you got a bunch of kids in the nursery, you might want to go and help them, okay? Go get your kids or whatever you need to do. That's your third option, all right? So I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to sing. And you can either go quietly out the door, you can sit and worship and whatever, talk to God, or you can come forward and let people be praying together, right? And so that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to do that. And you'll be dismissed afterwards. So God, thank you for your goodness to us today. Now, this is hard stuff. It's hard. But it's so good, so helpful. God, will you continue to help us understand, expand our souls, expand our faith, expand our minds, Lord, that we can comprehend you to greater degrees. God, may we be a church made of people connected to you and connected to each other in faith, waiting for the final redemption, waiting for the prodigal sons and daughters, waiting, trusting, knowing that you are conforming us into the image of your Son. God, may we look like Jesus. So do that here. Meet, especially God, I'm asking. For people are struggling. Right? God, heal them, help them, show them, hear them what you do. Do this as we look to you, our Redeemer. We thank you for your goodness, your grace. Thank you for walking with us. Thank you for your promises. Thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. Trust you, God. Grow us to be like Jesus. And because of Jesus, we have access to your throne, Father, through your spirit. We're grateful. And we thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.